Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, so I'm so honored to be here. I understand that this is something that you do once a year, and we're maybe a bit delayed because I live in Louisiana and Mardi Gras was early. So here I am in April. Um, I am Ashley Rogers. I'm the executive director of the Whitney Plantation. I opened the museum 10 years ago, so I've been an instrumental part of developing the museum and kind of you know, taking it through all of the iterations it's been through. So today I'm going to talk a bit about um, kind of a behind the scenes of how we do what we do and introduce you to the site and some of the things that Clint Smith talks about in the book and also talk about a little bit of the ongoing uh, research that we've been doing into the more recent history and the legacies of slavery at Whitney Plantation. I'd like to start with this quote from Clint Smith's book, which is the reason I've been asked to speak here today. So I hope you've all read Clint Smith's book. I think it's a, um, a wonderful book that really talks about this subject with a lot of nuance. He says, the Whitney exists as a laboratory for historical ambition, an experiment in rewriting what was long ago rewritten. It is a hammer attempting to unbend 400 years of crooked nails. It is a place asking the question, how do you tell a story that has been told the wrong way for so long? And I think what Clint Smith so beautifully captures in this passage is the enormity of our mandate and how impossible it is for us at Whitney Plantation to be the only answer to righting this historical wrong. He doesn't say it, but we're supposed to understand here that this work takes all of us. Now, not all of our visitors write as eloquently as Clint Smith does about Whitney Plantation. And in fact, we have a lot of visitors who come and leave their reflections on a wall. So one of my favorites that I've saved for 10 years is this one written by a small child. Who <laughs> And I think that in its own way, it captures our mission pretty well. Slavery is not right, and whoever made it happen is a jerk. Um, so for some background and context, Whitney Plantation is a museum and memorial located about an hour between Baton Rouge and New Orleans in what's called the River Parishes. We're in West St. John the Baptist Parish. That's on the west bank of the Mississippi River. It was a working sugar cane indigo and rice plantation from 1752 until 1973. John Cummings, our founder, who you read about in the book, if you've read Clint Smith's book, purchased the property in 1999 and started a 15-year process of restoring the plantation and preparing it to open to the public, which he self-financed. Ibrahim Asek, who you can see, so that's who's in this picture, Ibrahim Asek and John Cummings. Um, Ibrahim Asek, our director of research, helped him with the scholarly research, which was the foundation of our interpretation. The museum opened to the public on December 4th, or December 7th, 2014, which means we're coming up on our 10th anniversary. And since that time, we've seen over 550,000 visitors from all over the world. In 2019, our founders stepped away and donated the property to a nonprofit that we founded, which now owns and operates the site. Our mission is to educate the public about the history and legacies of slavery in the United States, and we achieve that mission daily through guided tours, self-guided tours for both adults and school children, and special programming, exhibits, and outreach. What makes Whitney Plantation unique is not only its singular focus on the history of slavery, but also the fact that it is a memorial built to honor people who were enslaved and who lived and worked on that land and throughout Louisiana. Visitors to the site go through four memorials with different focuses, and pictured here is the Wall of Honor, which is a memorial dedicated to over 350 people who were enslaved on that property for over the course of the 110 years that it operated during slavery. Um, we are still working on finding the names of all of the people who were enslaved there. 350 is a gross undercalculation, and it probably falls short of the real number by hundreds of people. Uh, we know that the largest number of people ever enslaved on that property at one given time is about 115. The memorial pictured here is discussed in Clint Smith's book, and it's called The Field of Angels. It records the names of over 2,000 children who died in slavery in St. John the Baptist Parish before the Civil War. In the center is the statue that Smith describes with such emotion. It depicts a black angel bringing a baby to heaven. Records related to enslaved people at Whitney Plantation show that enslaved children had high rates of mortality. 
Francoise, a woman who was enslaved at Whitney from her birth in 1830 until the time of the Civil War gave birth to 12 children. Seven died before the age of 12, and some died within just a few months of each other. Plantations in Louisiana were deadly. One historian, Michael Tadman, has documented that Louisiana sugar plantations stand out in the plantation south as the lone region with a negative birth rate. More people died on sugar plantations than were born. This demographic trend is very strong and very well documented in the Caribbean, but by and large, plantations in the United States had very strong birth numbers. Tadman shows a 20% birth rate in regions of the United States that grew things like tobacco and cotton, compared to the sugar districts, which had a negative 13% birth rate. And there are a lot of factors that contributed to this demographic pattern, tropical disease, especially yellow fever, malnutrition, and early motherhood. Some girls at Whitney Plantation had their first children at 12 or 13 years old. Workplace accidents also contributed to deaths. One of the children born at Whitney was struck in, in the fields by lightning. Like the Wall of Honor, the records that we represent in this memorial are not complete. These records come from the Archdiocese, where births and deaths were recorded for all people baptized into the Catholic faith, whether they were enslaved or free. But that doesn't include everyone who was enslaved in Louisiana, right? So especially since so many people came from the Upper South in the domestic slave trade, um, they wouldn't have been familiar with the Catholic faith. So they were not likely to be baptized in the church and wouldn't have had their births and deaths recorded. Or people who didn't have, um, who weren't religious at all, which there were a number of people who weren't religious at all. So this is still an undercalculation. And even for the people who are recorded in the roles of the archdiocese, their records may be incomplete. Many of the people listed in this memorial are recorded only as a little slave rather than having a name. This is one of the things that makes it so hard to study the stories of enslaved people. For the society at the time, their lives did not matter enough to record their names even in death. Whitney Plantation retains two original slave cabins, one of which you can see in this picture. This cabin was built on the neighboring Millaret Plantation, which became part of Whitney in 1919 and it was in use until the mid-1970s. The blue color on the wall is the last remnant of the last time that they were painted green in the 1960s. During slavery, houses like this would have been home to two families. Each door on the front porch would lead to a separate dwelling unit. These houses were frequently only two rooms, one on each side, which meant that people shared one common room as their bedroom, living room, dining room, and kitchen. In later years, many cabins such as this one had small cabinets attached to the back, giving them an additional half room of space. And when we come to the cabin, visitors frequently get hung up on the idea of crowding in these places as the thing that is um, maybe the most accessible way to understand what people were going through. But I encourage people to think of that in a different way. So people lived with their families not with strangers. And Francoise, who we talked about earlier, for instance, she would have shared a home with her husband if he lived on the plantation, which he may or may not have, and her children, Louis, Claire, Charles Valcour, Delphine, Fabian Sebastian, Florian, and Jean-Baptiste. In 1849, when her oldest child was six years old, Francoise's children started to die, one after another, until by 1855, none of her children were living. Her eighth child, Nancy, never met any of her older siblings. When Francoise's last child died in 1855 while she was pregnant for her eighth birth, what would her home have felt like? Her cabin, which had been active and noisy with her children, her bed crowded with their warmth, was empty. When these cabins were full, it was because families were together. And when they were empty, when people had more space, it was because their families were separated by death or the slave trade. Enslaved people had tenuous grasps on familial connections, and sometimes to try to understand what they endured, we have to change our perspective. The big house at Whitney, the home for the enslavers, was built in 1790. It is one of the oldest plantation residences still standing in Louisiana. This fact alone makes it a testament to the skill of enslaved craftspeople who felled cypress trees, made bricks, and frame the house using Norman trusses and bousselage. Typical plantation museums devote 90% or more of the visitor experience to the interior of the plantation owner's home. The point of these tours 
is to marvel at the way these wealthy people lived. When Whitney Plantation opened to the public, we displayed uh, antique furniture in this home and consulted with interiors experts uh, to ensure accuracy. And what we found was that no matter how much we focused the tour on the history of slavery, visitors would lapse into traditional narratives in this space. They would remark on how beautiful it was. They would say, wouldn't it be nice to sit here on the porch in the sunset? Sometimes they were disappointed that the house is actually quite small, only one room deep, much smaller than what they were expecting. Because even though they came to a slavery museum, they still craved the grandeur of the Old South. Many visitors think that this house is the plantation. So they come into the visitor center and they'll ask, where's the plantation? <laughs> and the plantation span close to 1,400 acres. What they mean is, where is the enslaver's house? Plantation homes were beautiful spectacles designed to hide the ugliness and brutality that made them. After 200 years, after all the work we did to honor enslaved people, the big house was still serving its function as a spectacle. These issues, combined with structural problems caused by high visitation, led us to rethink the interpretation of this space. In 2022, we removed nearly all the furniture in the house and sold it at auction. We kept pieces that might allow us to tell the stories of enslaved people's labor. And we also closed the top floor of the big house for most visitors in order to better preserve the structure. We wanted to make the enslaver's story less appealing and enticing. Anyone who wants to see a lavish plantation home can do so. There are five plantation museums within a 15 minute drive of Whitney Plantation. Um, but we wanted to deliver a stark visual reminder to our visitors that this is just a house. Some people are disappointed. Uh, some feel even now that the only thing that matters is the big house and that if they did not see something truly grand, they did not get their money's worth. Uh, our job is to reorient people and help them understand that traditional plantation narratives have obscured the stories that really matter. In addition to over a dozen original buildings that we preserve at Whitney, which span the years 1790 to 1950, we also have structures like this one, the Antioch Baptist Church, which were donated and moved to the site in the years before opening. This church is extremely significant to the black community on the other side of the Mississippi River, the east bank of the Mississippi. It was built in 1870 by freed people, and it served the community near Paulina, Louisiana until the time of Hurricane Katrina. The congregation formed out of a benevolent aid society called the Anti-Yoke Society. So I'll pause there if you don't, uh, a yoke meaning, um, a yoke, like for an animal, but it's also a symbol of slavery, right? So calling themselves anti-yoke tells you exactly what they thought about slavery. These are people who were just a few years removed from that institution. Um, and we know that that was the name of their society because it's preserved in official documents. Um, so these organizations, these benevolent aid societies were really common after the Civil War. They acted like life insurance and burial societies. So basically for these communities of formerly enslaved people to be able to pool their money and take care of one another. Some like the anti-yoke also formed other community organizations like churches and schools. And the anti-yoke society founded the anti-yoke Baptist congregation in 1868. And two years later, its members pooled their money to buy land and they built this church. So one of the reasons why this church is so significant is that what you typically see, you see a lot of architecture built by enslaved people throughout the South, but all of that architecture is for the white power structure, right? It's for enslavers. It was, it's things built for enslavers. And here you can see this incredible architecture, this incredible craftsmanship of people who had all those skills building it for themselves. And you can see that there's that, still that kind of resonant power in this space. Uh, that congregation still exists. They changed their name uh, to Antioch. So it sounds, sounds very similar, but not spelled the same. Um, and when they built a modern church, they donated this structure and we moved it to our property. Um, they are still active today. They, they come and do things at the plantation. They were here, they were with us during Black History Month. The choir performed in the original church and many of the members of that congregation have very fond memories of this church. They, I mean, because it was active until not that long ago. So this is the place where their ancestors were buried, where they were married, where they were baptized. And though this church is not a part of Whitney's story, 
Uh, it is a crucial way that we tell the story of freedom and empowerment that came with emancipation. And we help our visitors understand that there are long-lasting cultural legacies created by enslaved people and their descendants. Our research director, Ibrahima Sek, says that slavery is not just a story of brutality and forced migration, but one of culture and contribution. And this church helps us to tell that story. We are so undereducated in this country about slavery that one of the things we must do at Whitney is to provide our visitors with big contextual understandings of the nature of the system as a whole. We are, as Smith said, trying to unbend 400 years in an hour and a half. Most of our visitors have no idea of the scale of slavery, of its importance to our nation's growth and economy. This map shown here was drawn in 1858, and it shows cotton and sugar plantations on the Mississippi River between Natchez and New Orleans. Whitney is in the cutout section. There's like a red, there's a big lake, and there's a blue part and a red line. Coming down from that, there's a yellow section that says M. Haydell, that's Whitney Plantation. Um, it was one of the largest plantations on the west bank of St. John the Baptist Parish, but as you can see, every piece of land along the river was devoted to plantation slavery. Every single one of those sections is a plantation. This was one of the densest plantation districts in the nation. Sugar plantations were also agro-industrial. Sugarcane has to be chemically transformed from a grass into table sugar. And most of that work was done on the plantation itself. So every sugar plantation also had a factory where all of that sugarcane was then turned into raw sugar. This is a painting of a Louisiana sugar plantation from around the same time as that map, late 1850s. And it shows the highly structured gang style work where each crew had a separate job. So I like to show this painting because it really demonstrates. There's a few illustrations I'm going to show you that kind of explain how the, the nature of the sugarcane labor worked. So what you can see, I mean, obviously you see the line of cane cutters, right? And they're all in, you can see how regimented this is. They had overseers and foremen in the fields who were calling out for the labor to begin, it was happening synchronized at the same time, right? So what the cane cutters do, this is during what's called the grinding season, which is the harvest season. The cane cutters would go out before the sun rises, and just as the sun is starting to come up is when they start cutting. They would cut the cane at the top to cut off the, um, the green leaves that are at the top, they're not used to make sugar cane, and then cut down close to the root. The closer the better because all of the sucrose content is close to the ground. So they have to get close to the ground without uprooting it because it grows back from stubble, right? So this is, you know, very, very precise. And they're using cane knives, which are machetes. They're these long bladed knives and everybody's going at the same time and it's disorienting. The cane, when it's at full height, is about 12 feet tall, planted in rows that are then about two feet. So we're talking about something that's much bigger than human scale. Those cane cutters, the only thing they do is cut, and then they throw down the cane. They'll take their cane knife and kind of scrap, it's called scrapping, scrapping off the top of the cane, right? Throw that down, but you can see in the very, very, very foreground of this picture that there are little figures that are doing something else, and that is the work for children and women. What they're doing is they're bundling the cane. So all the cane that was cut by those cane workers, they'll take and tie them together and toss them into the carts. So you can see three cane carts that are getting loaded up. And those are driven either by oxen or by mules. And they're gonna go to the sugar mill, which is in the back. So you can actually see in the back, there's a whole other crew waiting for them. There's a better illustration of that here. So you see this cane cart is parked at the bottom of a conveyor belt. These were, um, they were already using fossil fuels by the 1820s. The sugar mill at Whitney Plantation was using steam power, had steam power grinders in the 1820s and they were using steam power for their conveyor belts as well. So they take the conveyor belts up into the mill. You can see the top of that here. So if you look, that picture that's on the left, that's the top of that conveyor belt. You see how the cane is being forced down into a grinder. This is why it's called the grinding season. 
So they grind down the cane, and what they're doing is they're extracting the juice on the inside of the cane stalk. That juice will then be boiled in a series of open kettles. You can see that happening top left. So the top left is the boiling system. This is called the Jamaica train. What they're going to do is that they're going to slowly boil down that cane syrup until what you end up with is this really, really thick um, liquid that will crystallize. So if you've ever made you know, jellies, jams, candies at your house, you understand this process, right? What you're doing is you're boiling out the water and evaporating it, right, to make candy. It's a similar process to making sugar. So the sugar plantations are going to produce two products, uh, raw sugar. When it crystallizes, they keep it in a pan, and the molasses drips off. So they have molasses and raw sugar. Those are both products that can be consumed like that, but they're usually sent out for further refining. The molasses to be turned into rum, the raw sugar to be refined and turned into white table sugar. It's a complicated process. <laughs> so, you know, I emphasize this with my visitors, especially because we kind of think about slavery as being field work. We don't think about all of these complicated processes to make, and, and, and sugar is the most complicated. Cotton is sold in a form pretty similar to how it grew out of the ground. That's not the case with sugar. And today, the sugar mills in Louisiana, this whole process I've described, the boiling, and you can see what this man is doing, he's the sugar maker. This is done today by scientists. They're in lab coats, right? This is, these are chemists. So these are people who have extreme skill. One of the people who was enslaved at Whitney Plantation was an engineer. And his job was to know how to fix all of the machinery to keep it running. So we're talking about people with highly specialized, highly technical skills. Now this type of labor on sugar plantations persisted a long time after slavery ended. Whitney Plantation operated until 1973, more than 100 years after the end of slavery. And I'm going to include some quotes from oral histories that I did with plantation residents over the last decade. Marion Pochet was born at Whitney Plantation in 1936 in a slave cabin. And she's describing the work that her father did. She says, no good job at all. Hard work. work. That's what I would call it. Hard work out there, you know, in the heat cutting cane when they burned it, and I guess that's why my dad died of lung cancer, by him inhaling that smoke out there. Um, after they cut the cane, they typically would burn the fields, which would burn up all of the trash, and it would also put nutrients back in the soil. Um, her father that she's talking about had worked at Whitney Plantation since about 1910. Um, during the Civil War, the Union Army took control of d the districts surrounding New Orleans and implemented a wage labor system. So wage labor came to replace slavery, and after the end of the war, sugar plantations were all using some form of this system. This is very different from sharecropping. Sharecropping, which a lot of people are familiar with, um, basically is a system where you know, people are in charge of a plot of land, they have to sell their crop at the end of the year, and then they have to pay off debt to the landowner in the form of rents, right? Paying for seed, paying for tools, things like that. But sugar workers, by contrast, did not own or control any portion of the produce of the fields. They were paid daily wages by the owner of the plantation for their labor. They continued to live in the exact same slave cabins. And the plantation owners continued to live in the big house. So this is the big house occupied in the 1950s, very, very similar to how it had looked before. Um, during Reconstruction, a labor market developed in the sugar districts as planters competed with one another for labor. So those that paid better could keep their laborers and workers could leave plantations. They could walk down the road and find a different job. If this person's paying better, they have better terms for their labor. Um, and as a result, labor forces could be pretty unstable. So planters sought greater control over their workers, and they found that control through wage fixing and building plantation stores. In 1877, the sugar planters in Louisiana formed what was called the Louisiana Sugar Planters Association, which became, by all intents and purposes, a cartel. Whitney's owner, Bradish Johnson, was a founding member, and he was also the first member, according to their official minutes, to suggest that they compare labor contracts, which is the beginning of what would become widespread wage fixing. 
Uh, once the LSPA began fixing wages, it was harder for workers to find better jobs. There, nobody's paying better than anybody else, and they're ensuring that stability on the plantations. And in addition to wage fixing, planters built plantation stores where workers shop for clothing, food, and medicine. These have been provided to, en to enslaved laborers. So enslaved laborers are given rations. They're given clothing. They're given you know, blankets and, uh, and food. But after slavery ends, the plantation owners start to charge for those things. Um, so this is another method of economic control. So this allowed the planters to keep their profits within the financial ecosystem of the plantation, and it kept workers tied to plantations. It was a common practice to hold back 50% of all wages until after the completion of the grinding season. Um, reason being that they need every worker for grinding. So if people have left before grinding, they're in trouble. Um, and so that meant that if you're holding back 50% of all wages, the workers had to buy on credit throughout the year. And when they got paid at grinding the remainder of their wages, they might have nothing to show for that work. This is another view of the plantation store after it was abandoned. Um, we're currently restoring this and hope to open it to the public in 2025. The system of debt that planters put in place during Reconstruction stayed active well into the 20th century. This letter to Whitney Plantation's manager in 1953 says, John Johnson Colored was hired by us this morning and permission is requested in order that his belongings may be removed from your plantation. We understand that Johnson owes a balance of about $25 and also that he has six days time to his credit. Will you therefore bill me for the difference as soon as possible? This is from a different plantation. And we know why John Johnson was in debt to his employer because those records have been preserved. He was buying rice, beans, sausage, sugar, lemons, milk, bread, oatmeal, Coke, and oranges. In short, he was feeding himself and he was not living extravagantly. He also owed $1.50 for the power bill for his cabin and he had uh, gotten an advance of $15 on his wages. We also know his wage rate from this document. With six days time to his credit for $17.90, he earned about 30 cents an hour on a 10 hour workday. $25 in debt then was equivalent to 83 hours of work. Workers like Johnson would find it very hard to make up the levels of debt that they accumulated through this system. And in Johnson's case, as we learn from this document, his balance owed of $12.78 was paid by his new employer, which was a, requ a requirement in order for him to be able to retrieve his belongings from his cabin, but it also meant that he started his new job in arrears. Cane workers lived hard scrabble lives in the 20th century. Marion and Clementine Poche, who were first cousins, remember their lives in the cabins as children of cane workers as being marked by scarcity. Clementine said, we didn't have too much when we were coming up. We didn't have too much of food you couldn't pick from. We mostly ate beans. One day white beans, the next day red beans. And Marion said, we didn't have nothing like you see a living room or a dining room or nothing like that. It was a bedroom and a kitchen and that was it. In the background of this photo, you can see the two slave cabins that remain on our museum property today, and they were moved from this field in their present location for visitors to see them. These were the cabins that some of these people I'm talking about were living in in the 1970s. One hundred years after emancipation, plantation residents still felt the tension of their history. Plantation workers that are interviewed were tended to diverge in their memories depending on their race, with whites more likely to say that relations between races were fine, and blacks more likely to say that they were strained. Percy Zerang was a white man who was born on the plantation in 1944. He was the son of the foreman, um, and they were in a lower class than the owners or the overseers, um, which was felt very severely by him growing up. Um, he was also the most likely of all of the white people that I talked to to cross racial lines and have friendships across race. And he said, when I asked him about that, that that was very unusual. Um, and he said, and I did, and my daddy was always on my butt. They're going to turn on you, son. And I said, no, they're not, daddy. So he got in trouble with his father for crossing those racial lines. And even though they were friends, he also told me that they wouldn't go into each other's houses. So there were certain ways that that structure was kept in place. John Howard, who was born at Whitney in 1961, 20 years later, said simply, it wasn't no Johnny B. Good back then between the blacks and the whites. <laughs> 
In order to supplement the food that they buy at plantation stores, cane workers kept livestock in their yards where they could buy cattle on the plantation, but this was also expensive and inaccessible to a lot of people. This photo is a boucherie that was happening at Whitney Plantation in the 1950s, but this hog belonged to the Zerang family. Um, it was the white Zerang family. It was easier for whites to keep up with the expense of raising and preserving hogs than it was for black families. The black families are also working throughout the day, these long days, so there's less time to come back and tend to a garden and tend to livestock. Many plantation residents, white or black, recalled keeping chickens in the yard, though, and having chicken dinners on special occasions. Before World War II, cane work was still largely manual, which meant that very little had changed in any meaningful way since the days of slavery. People still lived in slave cabins and cut cane using machetes. There was no electricity, running water or paved roads, and transportation was largely relegated to boats and trains. In 1946, Whitney Plantation bought its first combine, and that purchase would drastically change plantation labor. Most of the harvesting was done by machine after this point, um, and there were only a few trusted machine operators who continued to live and work on the plantation in the 1960s. When the plantation ceased operation in the 1970s, there were six employees cultivating 1,400 acres, which was work that had been done by over 100 enslaved people in the century before. Chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and ripeners also reduced the need for human labor. After World War II, planters began spraying the fields. The pesticide plane that sprayed Whitney Plantation, which is shown here, used endrin in the fields, among other highly toxic chemicals. In order to mark the boundaries of the property, the plantation owners compelled workers to stand in the fields marking the boundary lines with signs. The planes flew overhead and sprayed the workers who wore no protective gear. Endrin has since been banned, and in Silent Spring, Rachel Carson named endrin as a chemical that was more dangerous than DDT. John Howard said, a lot of people died from, I guess you could say poison now that I look at it, you know. Used to make some of the workers hold up signs in the field so the airplane could know where to spray. They ended up with all kinds of disease. You know, I guess you could say that it was right. I guess they thought it was right. And at the same time, I don't know. 100 years after the end of slavery, field workers were still subjected to violence in the fields, but it was more subtle. John Howard, who remembered his family members standing there, couldn't say for sure whether their exposure to toxic chemicals had killed them. Endrin did kill fish, however, and plantation residents observed it. Percy Zerang said fish would come through that pipe, and when they sprayed the next day, you had dead fish all over the place. At the same time that Percy Zerang noticed dead fish in the canals, overuse of Endrin on sugar plantations and chemical releases from a factory in Memphis led to massive fish kills in the lower Mississippi Valley. These two changing factors, the use of chemicals and the use of machines, worked together to reduce the size of the workforce, and that had an effect on the built environment at Whitney Plantation. The last remaining original slave cabins, which you see here, were torn down in the 60s to make way for more cane planting. And without the large number of resident workers, there was no longer any need to keep vacant buildings. Already they had dwindled. There were 22 cabins in this row before the Civil War. This photo from the late 1950s shows only six. In the late 20th century, plantations scaled back these operations, and younger generations did not want to take over plantations. Percy Zerang remembered, Daddy didn't want none of us working in the fields. There was a hope that younger generations would move off the plantation and find better paying work, both for black and white residents. Plantations had survived because they were passed from one generation to the next, and that's in terms of both the ownership and the field work. But with the changing of economy and society of the 60s and 70s, that became much more difficult. Throughout the 20th century, this had led to plantations being sold out to other industries. Oil was discovered in Louisiana in 1901, and by 1909 was when we got our first refinery. Standard Oil built a refinery in Baton Rouge. Um, and after that, it kicked off a, a long series of more and more refineries and petrochemical plants coming. Uh, plantation properties sold out to these operations, especially after World War II. So what I'm going to show you is we're back to the 1858 map, and you can see that density of the plantation district. This is the same map. It's showing you the same data, but what, what they've done here is every yellow dot was a plantation, and every red one is a petrochemical facility. 
So this region, which was at one time one of the densest plantation districts in the country, now produces 25% of our nation's petrochemicals. And today, we call it Cancer Alley. Citing plantation or petrochemical plants on former plantations leads to jarring contradictions like this refinery bordering a black cemetery. Some petrochemical plants on former plantations, uh, they, they operate plantation museums. So Garyville across the river from Whitney Plantation is where San Francisco is. And uh, it's owned and operated by Marathon Petroleum. So I've zoomed in there. If you're on the ground, you see that house. But if you look at Google Maps, that's what the surrounding area looks like. Uh, and until, until a couple years ago, Marathon was actually opening, they were operating the site as a museum, the, the oil company was. Um, San Francisco Plantation was home to one of the most photographed enslaved people of the Civil War era, Wilson Chin, who was photographed alongside instruments of torture used against him on that sugar plantation where he was held in bondage. These photos were distributed as carte de visite, which were used to raise funds for black schools in New Orleans during the Civil War. Um, here in this photograph, alongside the, uh, the paddle, the collar, and the chains, you can see if you look at his forehead, that Wilson Chin has keloids that spell out his owner's name from where he was branded. It says VBM for Valsam B. Marmion. The oil company that owns Wilson Chin's former site of enslavement, San Francisco Plantation, also uses the plantation as a wedding venue. In 1990, these issues came to bear at Whitney Plantation. The last owner died in 1982, and his children did not want to take over the plantation. They ended up selling the property to a Taiwanese chemical company called Formosa, who intended to build the world's largest rayon manufacturing plant on that property, while they were also going to operate the big house as a plantation museum. Wilfred Green, who worked at Whitney as a child and descended from a long line of Whitney plantation workers, was one of the most vocal opponents of Formosa, and he was, um, quoted in here kind of disputing this idea that these companies will come and bring jobs to the local population because his argument is that the jobs are not going to go to local people, which is typically the pattern that we see. The companies come in, they profit lots and lots of jobs, but then they import their labor as well. So the existing community is displaced, they lose property value, they're no better off economically, and they've lost that community that was in place. So he says, God knows we need jobs. And they're waving jobs to desperate people who are thinking about feeding their families. No guarantees, just promises. One day, somebody's got to stop and ask, jobs at what cost to us? What cost to our health and safety and quality of life? Nobody's ever asked us because we're black and poor. Formosa did not build at Whitney Plantation, mostly due to community opposition. In 1999, Formosa sold a portion of the property to our founder, John Cummings, who began work on the creation of the museum as we know it today. And th my favorite Wilfred Green quote, this man was a quote machine, he's got a lot of quotes, but this is the best one. <laughs> he's, when he's, he's asked what he thinks about uh, Formosa leaving, and he says, that's the best news I've ever heard. I can go to bed tonight and sleep real well. I'll say a prayer of thanks to my maker that maybe I've been partially successful. But Formosa backing out was far from the end, and today black activists in St. John are still fighting for dignity as plants pollute the air and water and keep buying more former plantation land for the construction of petrochemical plants. Um, some of the most notable area activists um, I'm highlighting here, Robert Taylor, who founded Concerned Citizens in St. John the Baptist Parish, he says, when they bought out the plantations, they left thousands of people still there on the periphery. These little communities that we have were the descendants of those folks. Our community is now the remnants of that old plantation life. We have been designated a sacrifice zone. That is ungodly. I cannot believe in the 21st century, in a so-called Christian country, that they decided that black people can be sacrificed for the profit of corporations. Sharon Levine, the founder of Rise St. James, is fighting Formosa again in St. James Parish, and she says, now the land and everything that grows on it is poison. We are boxed in from all sides by petrochemical plants, tank farms, and noisy railroad tracks. And unfortunately, at Whitney Plantation, this is something that we're still, we're still fighting. That land uh, that was sold to Formosa was sold a couple of years ago to a major grain terminal, which is trying to build 
um, a massive 57 silo facility on our fence line, um, which would all but destroy the black descendant community. They're locating at about 300 feet from the closest house. Um, Joy Banner, who's in the foreground here, our former director of communications is a descendant from Whitney, and she founded with her twin sister, Jo, an organization called the Descendants Project, explicitly to sue and fight these things, and we're a partner in those efforts. She says, we did not seek to be environmental activists. We were pushed into environmentalism by the failure of public bodies to hold 200 facilities along the banks of the Mississippi River parishes accountable. At Whitney Plantation, we've started to interpret these things to help our public understand um, what we're talking about. And we see all of this as part of our mission. Um, we use signage like you see here, talks like I'm giving today, to alert our audience that the descendants of enslaved people are still here and still standing up for themselves. Our mission is to educate the public about the history and legacies of slavery in the United States and environmental racism in our area is a major legacy of slavery. One of the times that I spoke to John Howard, he expressed a certain amount of disbelief at how much the world had changed from the time that he was a child. He said that his children and the other young people in the community had no awareness of the lives their parents and grandparents lived. He said the wagon, the cart and wheel, running barefooted, going to separate bathrooms, walking on a different side of the street, it's as if it didn't exist. At Whitney Plantation, it is our job to teach people about these things that they don't know exist that plantations operated deep into our current living memory, that the problems of slavery are not over, that the legacies of this brutal system appear in everyday places. We talk about people like John and Marion and Percy and Clementine so that future generations will know their stories, so we will understand how much we've achieved and how much work still has to be done. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ashley. That was excellent. Um, I would like to start off, if anyone has questions, we've got a few staff members who have note cards coming around. They'll collect if there's, <laughs> if there's ones written. And otherwise, if you've got a question, please go ahead and jot it down and hand it along. I can start out, though, with um, classically more of a comment than a question, but it's a lovely one. So it's not one of those, <laughs> like, let me <laughs> extemporize. It's, I would just like to thank you uh, and the Whitney Plantation. Uh, this person's family and them visited the Whitney um, in, uh, maybe, looks like possibly this year or possibly in 2019. Uh, they chose to do it specifically because they understood the Whitney's mission to educate on slavery and plantations and had no interest in the opulence of the slave owners. Um, wanted to say thank you. The visit to the Whitney surpassed their expectations, and thanks for trying to straighten all the crooked nails. <laughs> thank you very much. So. We have a couple of other questions. Um, okay, this one is about uh, the Whitney does not permit wedding photos mm -hmm. or weddings on the ground. Can you speak about the decision and the, the decision making process behind that? Well, you know, to be honest with you, there wasn't much of a process. We just, it was like, well, no, we're not going to do that. Um, you know, but there are some exceptions to that. Uh, so we actually have had people take wedding photographs twice. Um, both of them were black couples who wanted to highlight the stories of their ancestors in their wedding stories. So, you know, they actually, they chose to have wedding photos, beautiful wedding photos taken near the slave cabins to emphasize the fact that their ancestors were not allowed to legally marry. And so for them, it was a part of that narrative of, of how far they've come and, and honoring their, their ancestors where their ancestors came from. Um, and we did have a, a staff member, actually, who is a descendant who got married in the Antioch church. So it was a church, though. It's not, you know, we're not doing things in front of the big house. So there's a little bit of nuance there. You know, if there are people who, for them, it's, this is part of their story right, and part of honoring their ancestors. That's a very different thing than doing some fancy wedding. Um, but, you know, it's everything that we do. It's not just weddings, actually. It's also events. Anything we do has to be in keeping with the mission. I don't let people use our imagery without, you know, us knowing what they're using it for. I don't allow events on site that might disrespect the ancestors that we're talking about there. So there's a lot of different ways that we kind of carry that through. Thank you. 
Okay, this question um, says, we know about, and you mentioned about the sharecropping um, as another harmful and predatory system that came out of slavery and working on plantations. Does the Whitney Museum do any work surrounding those individuals or honor their history on sharecropping around the site? Yeah, so we, um, well, and again, I'm gonna keep beating this drum, wage labor, not sharecropping. Right, because there were no sharecropping and sugar. But, um, but we do talk about the wage laborers and we um, were expanding that narrative. So right now we, we got a grant from the National Trust for Historic Preservation um, to restore the plantation store and open it to the public. Um, all these oral histories that I've done with people, we've talked about the store, what it looked like, what they sold. We have a pretty complete record. So we're going to restore that to how it looked in the 1950s. And then um, the longer term goal would be to open another slave cabin to have it look as it did in the 1950s. So we really want to emphasize this idea of Jim Crow plantations because so many people think that the story ends in 1865 and you know we are talking about slavery. But I think it has been really meaningful for our visitors to learn how close to the present day it comes. You know, when I say that John was born there in 1961, you know, suddenly people are going, wow, you know, and we were operating until 1973. We're talking about things that happened recently, happened in our lifetimes. Um, so, yeah, so we're trying to really expand those narratives. And we do use um, audio from some of those oral histories in our audio tour. Um, so we've incorporated that, and we're continuing to do them. I have an interview with a 95-year-old on Wednesday, so I'm very excited about that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, this question is from someone who didn't read the book, and that is just fine. <laughs> Why is it I've never heard of the Whitney Plantation? Oh, I don't know. We don't advertise. Maybe that's why. Um, you know, uh, it's the challenge for historic sites to get, you know, known. Um, I think that's probably most of it. Um, but we do get actually quite a bit of attention. Um, you know, Clint Smith's book, we've also been in, you know, New York Times and all of these other publications. So I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, we're not, we don't, we don't get out there very much. We don't, I don't have an advertising budget. That's probably why you haven't heard of it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, forty percent of our visitors come from bus traffic though. And we have like the um the that district is well visited, you know, Oak Alley, our neighbors that have been doing it for forty years, they get like two hundred and fifty thousand visitors a year. We get about eighty five thousand visitors a year, so we do get a fair amount of visitation. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um this is about sort of the founding of the plantation as mm -hmm. um uh as a museum. So did Cummings always plan a plantation that told the truth, or was that a focus that evolved um, with time? Um, I, I don't think that he ever had an intention of doing like a, you know, hoop skirts plantation Not like the tour. Marathon Petroleum no, Museum. No, I mean, but an interesting thing is that like, right, so Formosa was going to operate a museum. Like I've seen their museum plan, it's very bad. Um, and then when they sold it to John, one of the conditions of the sale was that it be open to the public. So there was, an, and he had to commit a million dollars to restoring it. That's why it was hard to find a buyer. So there was an expectation that he would have to open it. Um, and I think that for him, you know, he's, a, he's an interesting guy, an 88-year-old white Southern lawyer, uh, you know, grew up poor, made a kajillion dollars. If you remember, um, does anybody remember the Fen Fen diet drug? From the yes. 80s, okay, so he was the lead prosecutor for the plaintiffs on that. There's like, he did tort law. So a lot of these big cases always defending people who had been hurt by corporations. I kind of see that as a thread. He's obsessed with things that aren't fair. He's obsessed with big people with power taking advantage of people with no power. And so to me, it's not surprising he got very interested in slavery when he bought this plantation. I don't think it was something he gave a lot of thought to before that. Um, and so, yeah, from my understanding of talking to him and working with him for a long time, as soon as he learned about that, that was the only story that could be told. And, you know, I think that there are a lot of ways in which the, his approach, his vision, what we're still carrying out a decade later 
is maybe bolder than it would have been if it wasn't conceived of by a guy who had a harebrained idea, right? Um, it, it, a lot of museum professionals would have put this through so many committees that it would have gotten watered down quite a bit. And so there's a lot of, um, there are ways in which that really helped us to kind of clarify the vision and clarify how we carry it forward. Thank you. There are some excellent questions. I'm sorry that I won't get to them all because we do have some time constraints. But I have another that I wanted to um, sort of I can wrap a couple in with this one. First, the comment is thank you for your enlightened point of view and um, the way you're conveying your message. Um, another is um, about how your um, how the visitors to your museum, uh, you know, how is their response? What are some common responses you see? I'm curious about how you train your staff mm. to handle the, uh, the array of um, experiences people must have. Um, but if you could talk a little bit more about that and the perspective that you bring and how that's received. Yeah, I mean, most of our visitors, like our visitors are self-selecting, right? They're there on purpose. I would say the vast majority of our visitors are there because this is the story they want to hear. Um, and so we don't really get like a lot of pushback, you know? Um, the comments that I make about you know, people get to the big house and it's doing the big house's job and they're going, oh, wouldn't this be nice? That's across the board. I mean, that's people who are very friendly to what we're saying racially. That's across the board. I mean, this is the point is that it, it is beautiful. This is plantations are beautiful and they're also terrible. And that's like kind of the crux, right? So, so there is some of that. There's some, you know, some kind of reorienting of our visitors around that. I would say that um, one of the things that I kind of, I mean, people have reactions all over the board. They're angry, they're sad, uh, you know, everything that you can think of, they're feeling. But one of the types of reactions that I see quite a bit that um, is most resonant with me, that I find most powerful, is that sometimes people feel lighter, sometimes people feel um, grateful. They've expressed that, um, you know, coming to this plantation where everything has been so terrible for so many people for so long, that it's this interesting thing that happens that you can feel a sense of peace there. Um, and part of that, I think, is that we are, we're telling people stories, you know, and we're telling them the way they should be told and honoring those people. In fact, we just define core values and honoring the ancestors on that land is, is in our core values. That's, that's centered around everything that we do. Not everybody who's from there has ancestors from there. I don't have ancestors from there. But we can still honor those people, and I think it's really important. So that's a big thing that we see. Um, in terms of training our staff, uh, it's an interesting thing, because actually we don't hire people who have any prior experience. I've only hired two people with history training maybe three people with history training over the past decade. So I've trained people who, you know, used to work in a potato chip factory, or, you know, they were, maybe they were teachers, but they did something else, or, you know, any number of things, janitors. Um, the only thing that matters is how much you care about the story and how much you care about the mission. Everything else we can teach. Um, We've had a lot of people who have worked there over the years who are direct descendants of people who were enslaved on that plantation, um, which I always allow people to talk about or not to their level of comfort. Um, there's a lot of people who have worked there over the years that didn't know their family's history connected to the plantation, and I've helped them to learn that through research. So, you know, I think for some of those people, it's been, you know, like I just, I just worked on this with the, the um, woman who works at our front desk. She's been there for five years. And I just found her ancestor who fought in the Civil War, and I gave her, her his pension file. And she said she felt really proud about that. That wasn't anything that she had known about. And so she's excited to be able to tell people those stories about her family and how deep their connection is. Um, so we train them. I give them like some content training. They have to read a lot. They have to follow tours. They write their own tour scripts. And then once they've done that, then they, they give practice tours. The whole process takes about three or four weeks. And they're not comfortable for about another four months. Right. Um, and you know, and people's reactions to them kind of also run the gamut. Uh, most people are very, very respectful. Um, most 
it's it's a it's a place where you know it's very rare when you're in your job that you have people come up to you and say thank you so much for what you do this is so powerful you're so powerful this is so incredible we don't get to hear that very often in our jobs and this is a job where you hear that quite a bit and so yeah there's some people who are jerks but that's not most of them <laughs> most of them are saying thank you so much i appreciate you and uh, and that help that encourages the staff to keep doing that work and I think that's the note on which we will close. Thank you for doing this work and thank you for bringing it here today. Thank you.